Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, we have Yuri Gordon back. Uh, last time, we talked about Freddie Perlman, some international events. I think uh, the current regime in Israel had just got elected, and uh, we reflected a little bit about that uh, on the other episode. Um, right now, Yuri is working on uh, Freedom News, which is the oldest anarchist publication. It's uh, by Kropotkin, started in 1886 in London. Um, you've been working a lot on uh, stuff in Argentina, stuff in Chiapas. You did a couple interviews on that. And right now you're focused a lot on extinction scenarios, uh, pessimist philosophies, and antinatalism. Um, so a little off topic for you, but never quite off topic given <laughs> your past. Um, I wanted to have you on to talk specifically from an anarchist and also a Jewish perspective about Israel and Palestine and, yeah. um, Zionism. So, uh, there, I know we could probably go on for days about all of those topics. So we'll try to do it in an orderly fashion, um, uh, when I talked to you earlier, you said you wanted to touch on some important things about the connection between the current Israeli government and Putin and Trump. Yeah, I mean, I had a couple of sort of thoughts that, you know, um, first of all, you know, it's been it's been a, a, a really awful two months. Um, I remember that, you know, it was actually... Traveling down to the Anarchist Book Fair in London in on seventh of October when the when the Hamas attack took place and you know feeling like it was just going to be absolutely awful uh, and seeing everything that's been going on since then and kind of the horrendous number of people killed on uh, among the Gazans and we've kind of had an absolutely tumultuous two months and and it's been it's been just just absolutely awful so you know i just want to acknowledge that you know we're talking and and providing whatever analysis and content amid amid just a, a huge tragedy uh something that's going to scar uh everybody in palestine as well for for generations and really the sort of catastrophic result of, of this fascist Israeli government that, that is uh, forming around Netanyahu and his attempt to escape um, justice and, and, uh, and his own corruption affairs. I guess there are, I mean, in terms of, you know, a lot has been said about every, all of this and, and I'm just trying to think about, you know, stuff to say that people haven't heard a thousand times. So right. I guess the two things that, that come to mind first is to say that, you know, it seems to me that the level of destruction of civilian targets by Israel and Gaza and the kind of very wanton um belligerent action within a, a tightly populated civilian area shows uh Israel's sort of taking a cue from from Russia i think there is a sense for Netanyahu strategically and for the the messianic crazies that this is a window of opportunity for them to establish some crushing facts on the ground the way that Putin's been trying to do not just in Ukraine but previously you know we've seen in in Chechnya and Georgia and and that kind of behavior so I, you know, for that reason, I think that it's lazy to say that Israel is just carrying out, you know, American uh, foreign policy interest, or that it's just being a, a, a arm of American imperialism, because there is a, a real sense in which it's actually Russian imperialism with which Israel has been aligning itself lately. Um, and I think the Israeli government's bet, I certainly Netanyahu's bet, is on Trump being re-elected in the White House. And so this is sort of them showing their connection to this 
uh, right-wing populist acts, kleptocratic axis, uh, which you know, which they see, and, and I think they're they're essentially right, as still kind of having this ascendancy. And if Trump gets elected again, then you know, then then their bet is going to be a successful one. And uh, right now, they're trying to turn this into a continuous war of attrition in order to avoid the day after, which is, which, you know, because the, the Israeli public, while it is, as usual, kind of jumping to attention and supporting its uh, government and army, uh, while its media completely conceals from it what's going on in Gaza, is also seething against Netanyahu and his government and uh, their negligence and their completely wanton a destruction of of kind of every public norm and you know their uh their submission to the religious right uh you know the, the general public in Israel understand that it's been hijacked by Netanyahu and the religious right and and this is kind of it's it's in a way you know these wars come exactly at the best time when those social rifts are opening and they serve this function of kind of renewing the kind of, you know, sense of, of um, a, like this false siege mentality mm-hmm. among the Israeli public, right? There's a real inversion there because it's the Palestinians who are in Gaza were under siege, but it's, you know, the Israeli public is, is kind of, one of the complexes in Israeli public culture around the occupation is this kind of sense of victimhood and, and everything else that we can talk about. But that's, you know, every, anyone who knows the background of how things are going in, in, in those societies can, you know, understand that. So right now, like, you know, Netanyahu would like this to continue to be a low intensity war going on for the indefinite future in order to avoid the, or at least until the American elections. In order to avoid the the, uh, the committee of inquiry, to avoid his own uh, a trial, you know, to avoid the renewal of public protests in Israel, which have been huge against Netanyahu, and, right. you know, and this is this is the real kind of disaster here that you know there is there is a sense in which all of this uh, kind of spontaneous organization, the mutual aid, and so on, is has had to be now diverted into sort of the the home front war effort right um there's there's of course a lot a lot to be said about that and you know and we see we would probably see parallel uh, phenomena you know um in other similar situations but but i think you know so that's one aspect of it the other thing i guess i wanted to say is that you know when people think about it, it's important to consider hamas's position here and to not fall into kind of this uh, side choosing, right? That, that it's possible to say that, that, you know, both armed organizations are bad. Uh, one is much bigger and can, can, can do much more death, right? But I think it's, it's, we need to perceive from, from the, the, the kind of suicide action dynamic with, in the Hamas attack by way of suiciding the people of Gaza, like they're they're basically doing, they're, they are pushing towards martyring the Gaza population. They see that as part of kind of their modus operandi, right? So there is there is a, a it's kind of a a suicide by occupier, um, and it's you know it's it certainly was a, a, an act that that really manages to. Uh, to terrorize the Israeli public by pressing exactly on 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 the buttons that you know that are most uh, uh, vulnerable there. Um, so of course the level of Israeli state terrorism is 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 much bigger, right? In terms of body count and levels of destruction, but I think you know the the Hamas uh, uh, kind of terroristic tactics are are no less. A cruel and calculated to cause as much kind of psychological trauma as they can to the Israeli public, which which they understand exactly and they've done very effectively from that point of view. 
Um, so, you know, so those, those are two things to say there. And, and I think it's important to just be able to, I don't know, have, have a very clear voice that says ceasefire now, hostage exchange immediately, BB to prison. Uh, and we have to, you know, like the minute that we can just end this, then, you know, I, I think the Israeli far right is done for from an internal. They, they, they've really, really put their foot in it this time. And that's why they're going to try to, to hold on, right? Until, until the, like saying ceasefire now is means don't keep this going low intensity until the U.S. election, which is basically what they what they would do if they could. Right. Right. So so like we need to stop this becoming like Ukraine. Now, of course, you know, like everybody else, I feel absolutely powerless here and seeing that, you know, um, but, you know, like the Israeli government, like they're they're losing the last bits of goodwill they have even in Washington. And at this point, like we still have, you know, what's been going on in the last days, both in the UN and with with the kind of anti tank shells and so on, um, where the US, you know, vetoed the the resolution, and where where Biden kind of went went around Congress to sell more anti tank missiles to Israel. But this is like I I, I don't get that they're doing it very enthusiastically. To me, it seems like what's going on is is you know. They're just, I mean, it's very clear to them that it's damaging them even electorally at this point. I'm talking right. about the Democrats. Um, the same with Britain and, you know, like all, all the, like France is, is, is clearly opposed to what's going on. Um, it's, it's actually, you know, action, like the site, like who's not saying anything and who's not in the, in the, in the headlines for this Russia. Yeah. And, and in a sense, like that, you know, there is there is something there that, that has to do with Israel actually kind of playing on both fronts there, you know, being wanting on one hand to get close to Saudi with America, on the other hand, kind of emulating a lot of the Russian sort of attitudes to, to kleptocracy and and you know a, a destructive war of attrition against the civilian population. Um, on a much kind of more condensed scale, of course, you know, the whole the kind of geographical scale of it is much smaller, of course, which, which makes it more horrendous. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of the international context that this is happening in, okay? So this, this war has a function within this kind of, you know, anti-democratic, kleptocratic realignment of some of the major uh, superpowers, which we've been seeing for you know ten years at least, right? I mean, absolutely. It's yeah. Uh, it's not yeah. The dynamic is intensified, but it's been around for a while. So yeah, it's. I mean, it's really hard to not feel powerless uh, in this situation. I feel like you know a lot of people in the United States, you know, are hopeful that if they could get. Biden, or if they could get the right kind of BDS movement strong enough that they'll be able to, you know, have some kind of impact on, on uh, the war Israel's waging. And I am pretty skeptical about the opportunities in that. Um, yeah, I don't think there can be anything really immediate, but I think, you know, there are a lot of symbolic actions. I think if anything, we're seeing kind of the, 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 you know, a very clear um, decoupling of, of American Jewish publics from the automatic loyalty to the state of Israel. That's that's very clear. Yeah. Um, and there is a, a tight shift in American public opinion, and and in general, like you know, there is there is this huge gap now that. That is just getting bigger and bigger between governments and public opinion. If that's in terms of, you know, um, I mean, again, it, it might may, it might not be the case for all of America or for all of, and certainly not for Israel. But you know, when we're talking about 
neoliberalism, when we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about um, Israel and Palestine, like, you know, the, the, the publics are clearly way to the left of their governments. That doesn't make them, you know, a socialist or an anarchist public or anything like that. But, but there, is, there is that huge gap and that's, that's felt. And the, and the answer to that is going to be the erosion of democracy. Right. Which is already very, very well eroded, but even kind of the formal side of it, right? So, so we're seeing now, like, you know, a live option of essentially moving, you know, moving away also explicitly and not just uh, stealthily uh, from, from even formal democracy in, in, in some, you know, in, in some at least Western, Western powers. So something that, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know who is aware of this in the audience. Jews only make up about two to 3% of the population. And yeah, there's some, you know, uh, importance in what Jewish opinion is on the matter, but there's a, you know, the rest of society as well. And there's a lot of right wing elements who, uh, or even authoritarian communist elements that are eager to push an authoritarian agenda in response to this situation um, that I think pre pretty heavily outweigh whatever uh, the Jewish American population is going to think. I'm not. I'm not optimistic. I mean, I think. I think that you know, there's been. There's been like as far as that look. There's, but I think sociologically. I mean, I'm. This is what you know. The Jewish population might might be very small, but when it comes to Israel, it has more moral weight and more public weight. Right. And there is a bit like one thing is that what what we've seen in the last decades is a is a takeover for example of formal jewish institutions by a kind of right wing trumpian bbist uh, uh, set of political actors um so that that's quite intensifying but you know i mean i i really i i i think we're we are at a at a point of tectonic shift it's just hard to to see at whether you know this is certainly the, the i mean i think it's going with the, with the kind of general sort of beginning of the fall of industrial civilization and everything else right the the we shouldn't really detach these from one another we have a global permanent war that's getting more continuous flashpoints that, that, that are not going away. We have a, a climate process that is in tatters in, in COP28 now being, you know, run essentially by the oil exporters uh, who are all planning to increase their production. So this is all kind of reaching up and up to a boiling point. And, and you know, the, the, it's, it's very hard to, to see something like this going on in, in perpetuity. Like, it feels it feels like it feels like you know one or two more of these flashpoints and we could we we could end up with a nuclear conflict um there's there's all kinds of of nasty scenarios to to contemplate here um yeah. uh, and think... and you know and social movements are very weak in this context it's 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 a problem right we're we're, we're you know i mean it's like for example here in britain it's very clear that the Tories have had it electorally, um, but okay, maybe that's a, maybe maybe that's a, a clarion. Uh, it's very clear that that a Labour government would be still very neoliberal and and kind of very right wing, right? It's not it's not they're uh, they're doing saying what they're saying now just to get elected and then they're gonna kind of you know flip their skin. Oh, surprise! We're a you know social democratic progressive government. That's not gonna happen. Um, in Israel, again, they might get rid of the extreme right the next election, whenever that happens, if that happens, right? So they're probably going to get rid of the religious right in the government. They're probably going to get some kind of, you know, government that's composed of centrist ex-generals, but still going to be the same shit, right? It's, it yeah. might be less Putinist. It might be some kind of an interregnum. But, you know, the, 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 the general trend is, is, is an authoritarian and kleptocratic trend. Um, 
and we're still we're still deep inside that and and getting you know and we're still seeing signs that it's not going anywhere we've seen the elections in argentina we've seen the elections in the netherlands um all of this all of this shows us that you know and that there's something that in in that right wing tide that is that is still very much there yeah uh, and, and that i you know i think i agree with the trajectory because you know a lot of what the climate crises are going to cause is population migrations like massive already happening already happening which i mean has, i think you know, you know people need to realize that the one massive driver of the civil war in syria was a series of climate related bad bad harvests and and crop failures that pushed a lot of farmers into the cities this is we're talking back you know when when was the first kind of flare up of the Syrian civil war? We're talking way back, right? So so already the Syrian civil war, already you know Libya, all, all of this stuff, you know, the, South America, the, like everything is already kind of, we're already seeing waves of climate refugees. It's here, right? Right. We don't we don't need apocalyptic fiction to to talk about these things. This is what's going on. And there's you know the way that's used by the right is, you know, they get a boost uh, from the xenophobia in society and all the different elements that, you know, react to migrant populations in racist and xenophobic ways. And I think ultimately, you know, this is this is about kind of the 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 more the richer populations in the world not wanting to let go of their perceived prosperity and level of material consumption, which, and, and they understand that, you know, that is something that is going to be necessary. And I think that unless, unless we show more vocally how that can happen or you know, within contexts of, of community control, within contexts of, of ultra-democratic grassroots level local management, um, based on, you know, gift economies, based on communal solidarity and all the rest of the good stuff, then then people are going to keep holding on to their goodies. I mean, I, I, I'm not optimistic. I'm just, I just worry really that just nationalism is just too fucking strong that, that, you know, like, and it's like, in a way we're in the same place that we were at the beginning of world war one, you know, where, you know, you've got these, these massive conflicts that are, that are just pushing people back into a, a kind of patriotic loyalism, um, and and I think I think that's you know that's that's a real shame because you know we, we you have the kind of identification of 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 globality and liberalism and so on that that became identified with these new global elites that rose at the same time and we're talking about right very mobile finance we're talking about very mobile media uh, we're talking about the high tech and. The kind of default response was this kind of, and, and especially after the the financial crisis of two thousand and eight, and then the you know the, the immediate response was this closure back into national silos, and the rise of the, of, of far right parties. Um, I want to believe that you know the next twenty years are going to see a massive change in that respect because of the change of population, in the sense that you know the, the kind of boomers are going to die out but if you're looking at the united states you know or at israel those are examples of countries where you have younger generations who are just as right wing if not more oh my god i saw this video this music video that apparently was the top uh download recently in israel and it is what was that? Shit, let me look it up real quick. It was like, some awful right wing thing or whatever. Yeah, I mean, exactly. during a war that always happens, right? I mean, I think I think you need to compare the public atmosphere in Israel now to something like what was in the United States at the end of two thousand and one, after nine eleven. That's that's the kind of you know uh, awful a patriotic kind of self-enclosure that, that was felt there. And I don't know how many of the listeners remember that period 
uh, if they were too young. But but there's definitely that kind of sense. So it's yeah. yeah I, I mean, that's I not guess. it's not surprising. The, yeah, the group is called. Uh, oh, you mean those those kids who who were singing this awful Arbu, song? Arbu is the song. And Ness, then? Ness, and Stilla, I guess, is the name of the group. I can look it up, and I'll send you the link. But it, I mean, when I saw this, I like was immediately like. It was very clear to me how the youth in the United States and the youth in Israel are going in two very different directions. I don't, I, you know, I don't have kind of the reliable surveys or stuff to talk about that intelligently, but I, I just don't know, man. I think, I think we're in, we're in, we're in bad, bad, bad way, and ultimately, like. I don't. I don't know if it ever gets better. Um, you know, maybe may, like there, the, the, there is there is a general process of 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 decline, of a return to a to a new type of feudalism, of uh, of uh, national silos, of uh, deterioration of living conditions. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think that that it's. Um, you know, if we need to think what what do these what do these things prefigure in terms of what we're going to see in you know, fifty years down the line, hundred years down the line, Some and what what our role is it as anarchists within that? You know, and but I, you know, and at the moment the movement is so is so weak in most places. Yeah, that's one thing that you know is very different about uh, World War One and now is the position of the labor movements, the position of socialism and anarchism. Yeah. I mean, maybe the comparison is actually to the, to the, to the kind of early thirties after the labor movement had been so decimated by years of, of, you know, following the crash of the twenties. But I think, you know, I think, I think the financial crash, the, um, the kind of long-term effects of that, once the, the Occupy kind of wave fizzled out, like, where where is the next wave of struggle, right? Where is the next yeah. uh, global wave of of progressive uh, of progressive movements? I mean, I see some of it in the climate movement. I see some of it in the in the in the kind of Palestine solidarity movement. Those those things are happening, but there's a feeling like it's just going into into the kind of world of of Trump and Putin and Xi. And 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 you know and and the Tories and the and you know and the AFD. Um, so well, one of my issues with what's happening, uh, just to transition the topic a little, is that I I think a lot of people are feeling right now that the Israel Palestine is the next um, potentially radical, you know, motivating situation in the world that's happening right now and uh but the way that it's manifesting as public protest at least in the united states is particularly uh under the under the symbol of anti-zionism and one of the i mean right off the bat i just don't like single issue movements it just mm -hmm. I'm not, I, you know, as an anarchist, I like to oppose things as an anarchist. I don't like to mm -hmm. attach myself to, you know, I'm a partisan of just this one issue or that, that other one issue. Um, but the discourse on Zionism is problematic, mostly, you know, obviously there's just a lot of general ignorance about what it is, what its history is, and how it's been used in in different historical contexts, including the current one. Um, but on the other hand, it's it's uh, I think there's a lot of more real politic driving the situation than ideology. And it worries me to see 
such an emphasis on beliefs that people in the United States might have, especially Jewish people, about what it means to be Jewish, when there's, it seems like that's the least um, uh, powerful force in the matter. So I kind of wanted to talk about Zionism a bit, especially from okay. an anarchist and Jewish perspective, and just try to sure. sort that out a little. Uh, well, I don't think we're ever going to sort that out, but I'll say a couple of things. One is that, you know, like as anarchists, we're always going to feel uncomfortable in single issue movements where people don't bring in the rest of the politics, where the politics is not intersectional. Sometimes it is, right? And I'm not saying I'm like among the uh, Palestine Solidarity Movement, there are a lot who do have a very decent intersectional and decolonial and feminist and anti-militarist and, and, and internationalist point of view. And, and that's, you know, and, and are able of, uh, uh, of expressing empathy with all ordinary people and, and accusing structures instead of groups and seeing things, uh, you know, seeing the vertical conflict that needs to be focused on rather than the kind of horizontal conflict, right? The, the conflict between those in power and those without versus kind of looking at things as, as kind of in the terms that states want us to look at them, which is along lines of national and religious loyalties. But a lot of people do want to have a simple kind of black and white, tell me who's right, you know, uh, A against B and I have to choose a uh, conception of, of what they're doing. And that comes with, you know, a lot of uncritical or misinformed or whatever it is kind of attitudes to stuff. Plus, you know, in the Palestine Solidarity Movement, you also have plenty of conservative uh, uh, Islamic uh, and or uh, uh, Arab nationalist forces that are also part of that movement, right? right. And as someone who part and as an anarchist who participates in these movements, then I have to deal with that and and have a have have a have a dialogue with that where it's possible. But it's a uh, but it's not not going to be necessarily a a, a, a movement. As a, as a protest movement that comes up during up flares up of the conflict, right? And that and that just we've seen that previously. Now it's just much bigger and much worse, right? Um, but within that movement, it's always going to be a mixed bag. Now, when it comes to Zionism, I think there's like here's the key. Okay, there are two issues here, and they and they're both very different, but they can both be right at the same time. One is talking about anti-Zionism as part of an informed attitude that is focusing on a supremacist ideology that underpins the apartheid regime with all the intersection critique that that involves in order to be, you know, that is well informed, that's very specific about what it means, okay? I prefer the term anti-apartheid to anti-Zionist, to be honest, and that's because of the other one, which is using anti-Zionism as an anti-Semitic dog whistle. Yeah. Which also exists. Okay? So, like, like everybody else, I have a problem with the um, universalization of that within, let's say, the, the kind of anti-Semitism definition by the uh, international, what is it, the Holocaust Education Organization, whatever, that, yeah, the yeah, one yeah. that's being adopted quite widely which which tends to say that you know talking about anti-zionism or is can be anti is anti-semitic right the like the point is it is sometimes and sometimes it isn't okay and some and i think that there are decent people in the palestine solidarity movement who are try, trying to say anti-zionism in order to not come across as anti-semitic in order to say we're against a particular form of regime, we're against, you know, the idea of Jewish supremacism, we're against the dominant ideology of the Israeli state, we're not against Jews. But because there is also a, a kind of 
bad faith use of Zionism to to conceal or to or to kind of legitimate what appeared to be dehumanizing attitudes that intended to get at Jews that 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 fa- that kind of falls afoul of that. You know, so I, I'll just give you an example, right? So, like on that day of of the Hamas attack, I'm on this WhatsApp group of Palestine Solidarity. One of the th- single issue things I'm not going to name exactly which, and there people were posting, you know, pictures of you know the kids at the nature party that got shot up and murdered and raped, and some of them were like hiding inside this dumpster. And the title someone gave it was we we're talking about like Zionists cowering from the resistance. Right. So, you know, it's very clear that just, what do you mean that, that you're calling them Zionists? So the, the fact that they, you know, you're making a certain assumption about what they think about, you know, uh, uh, in order to justify them being attacked or, or in order to justify harm to civilians. There's something wrong there, right? It's like, yeah, that, I think that, that is where that is where Zionism is used to, uh, sort of cover for glee at the killing of civilians, right? Which is which is just, you know, so that so both things are happening. So you know, it's it's and uh, which is why I think you know taking an anti-apartheid stance is a stronger kind of slogan than taking an anti-Zionist stance in this in this in this instance. Yeah, and also puts emphasis on you know real practical like activity and not so much on the ideas people might have in their head or what they might call themselves because i think there's also a third a third thing that's happening which is not quite pernicious but it's just a uh maybe even a generational thing in the united states where you know uh jews who are boomers or maybe even some gen xers will think of themselves as zionists just because in this really bland vague way without any because kind of- because they have because they have a nostalgic association with Israel as a democratic country supposedly and as a progressive country uh and because they you know they don't code zionism in terms of jewish supremacism right they code okay. zionism in terms of a some kind of notion of jewish a national reawakening in Palestine, which they think could be not at the expense of the Palestinians. Right. Um, and, yeah, um, but, but you know, but that's, I mean, that's bankrupt. But the question is like whether you're trying to get at those people or whether you're trying to support the Palestinians, first of all. Well, that's the problem, right? I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's two two types of, you know, just for a simple way to think about it there's been two types of direct actions that i've seen getting reported there's ones that are really like directed at you know the military industrial complex and you know fucking up you know like water tanks or whatever at like uh, or company uh, offices or yeah whatever it is but then there's jewish businesses getting attacked they're like just like you know like a deli or whatever or like swat or you know call, going to a synagogue and spray painting zionist on it or whatever and that that's that's anti-Semitic bullshit. OK, it might not be a ideologically anti-Semitic on a Nazi level, but it's bullshit. Now, I'm not saying that Netanyahu and the right wing in Israel don't have partial responsibility for that because they are portraying themselves as the leadership of the Jewish people. Right. Internationally. Right. They're saying you're not a good enough Jew if you don't support, you know, building the third temple and Jewish supremacism in Palestine, which Trump reinforces too. Of course, and and they have also taken over the the Jewish official institutions. Right. That doesn't take away responsibility from someone, you know, being an idiot and 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 attacking a synagogue or or a, or a Jewish business. I mean, that's, you know, that's bullshit. That's that has that that shows zero political analysis that shows zero connection to social movements. You know, that's, and I, and I don't think that's a legitimate part of, of resistance to this war. Of course not. Um, And, and I don't know who that's coming from either. Right. You know, right. I I would like to, who knows, who knows. Right. So, you know, there is, there is a lot there that, that to me, like, you know, 
for, and 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 there and it's so inflammatory. Like right now, you know, they put like um in Alex today there was an article by someone. Oh, about, you know, the hypocrisy of Western academia and this and that, like that congressional hearing, right? That was reported in Israel as Harvard president refuses to say that calls for genocide are, uh, yeah, are, are uh, uh, illegitimate. Right. So then in Aretz today, they, they, they published somebody's like uh, Chichanover who won the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Economics, right? They published something of his against the, the – and this is the Israeli liberal paper. And the picture accompanying it was this, this plane that was carrying like a Palestine flag. And after it, it was saying Harvard supports killing Jews. Right. And the caption for that picture was, this is an anti-Semitic protest in Harvard. This is a pro-Palestine protest where what actually happened was this was this was yeah a pro-Israel kind of a, a protest de- denouncing Harvard right with the Palestinian flag and so on that, that it was it was a pro-Israel student organization that did it um, but it was reported as you know so so there is there is so much kind of you know uh, a situation where where people are are looking for for this where it doesn't exist as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and where it's and 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 another example of where it's locking into kind of this anti-elite discourse that we find coming from Trump and others, but this time in a in a kind of oh they're they're the anti-Semitic ones. <laughs> where actually it's you know the right wing in the U.S. is the anti-Semitic one. Let's let's be honest, right? I mean, I think you know I think I think the real danger to Jews in the United States right now is from the right wing. I'm not. I'm not going to deny. You know, yeah, there have been in the context of this war attacks on synagogues and everything else. But so far, all the lethal stuff that's happened against Jews in the United States have been has been from from the far right, from yeah, white there's, supremacists. There's no one. It's you can't even necessarily figure out if like this is just some far right groups that are posing as leftists or whatever there's a lot that's of that also going. possible or or it's just some dumb pro-palestine kids just don't have their political abc sorted out right right and that that can also happen and you know so because i'm i'm I, i'm very weary of, of crying false flag and stuff right mm-hmm. <laughs> but this case with the harvard display so that was that was that was literally a false flag protest right with with a palestinian flag the, yeah, you're talking about the the airplane that flew over yeah. with the flag. Yeah. So from everything I, that I saw, that that was a, a a protest against Harvard. Yeah, I'm also skeptical about just anything that supposedly happens on a college campus to begin with. I mean, the like, what? Why use students as a as a political kind of chess piece in a propaganda war well, i mean i think students are their own uh, actors right I, I don't think we should take away protagonism from them but you know sometimes they do things better informed and sometimes less well informed and and you know um i think a lot of the stuff that that's been going against palestine solidarity student groups has, has really been like um manipulative attacks and grabbing onto kind of maybe not the most sensitive phrase or something that someone said in a meeting in order to paint that whole movement in a bad light, right? So, you know, I I, I really don't think the pro-Palestine movement is anywhere as anti-Semitic as it's, as it's claimed to be by Israeli supporters. It's not no. to say that there aren't phenomena or that there aren't, you know, there isn't stuff going on as well or that there isn't just an... Uh, a kind of lack of of uh, attentiveness to nuances and stuff, but like th- th- it's it's something that we've been through so many times already, and you know people just don't learn. But you know those right. who have seen it are so like, you know it's it's just that's just you know that's just the way it is every time, and you bang your head at the wall. But that you know, but that's the way it is. Like it, it's a repeat of the whole. Uh, critical race theory, you know, paranoia that I don't know how much you. Yeah, no, in a way that's, that's true. I mean, which, you know, and, and, and some people say, say stupid things that, that, that contribute to, to it being stereotyped in that way. 
And some people have, you know, find it, you know, like important to to posture in certain ways and, and to say things that, you know, that are said may, not in order to like advance a political analysis that can add something to, to action, but in order to position themselves socially as like saying the right things or, or whatever it is. Um, and sometimes that, that, that kind of hits a dissonance. Uh, but that's that's the nature of of a bit of this kind of uh, you know uh, gestural politics of of social media these days. And I, but I don't you know I th- and that gets amplified you know by 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 media with interest in that. Mm-hmm. But I think, like you said, you know what matters is choosing the right kinds of action, choosing the right kind of messaging. Again, it might not make a huge difference but that's you know that's that's the most that can that can be done at the moment so specifically as a jewish anarchist Mm. both of us are Mm. what what do you i mean we're a minority within a minority within a minority and you know as far as ideas and population and everything else goes what i mean i've haven't been as stressed out about politics as I have been lately since like, I don't know, maybe after nine 11 happened or something, mm. but um, it's, uh, it seems pretty difficult to figure out what, how to position oneself as far as messaging goes or, you know, what types of groups are worth, participating in and things like that. And I think that this is something broadly experienced. I've talked to other anarchists who are Jewish that, you know, are really finding this situation to be impossible, really disillusioned by it. And, you know, almost ready to just walk out on being politically active altogether. And um, yeah, I'd like to maybe, I don't know, see if we, we could bring some things up that are encouraging or, some ideas i mean the the most encouraging thing that i have found in 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 this context has been like interaction with actual palestinians um you know uh not with those who who might use them as a as a thing to peg their own, their own thing agenda or politics on that doesn't exist in every place, but you know, in in, a, in in places like Berlin or London, where you do have at least, or New York probably, or wherever, where you have sort of a, a decent young radical Palestinian-led movement, which is also feminist and is also anti-capitalist and and everything else then that's, you know, that's where I think we should put our solidarity, first of all. Um, And then with other radical Jews who are being persecuted for saying what we say and thinking what we think. Um, Yeah. And I also understand if, if, you know, if, if people just find it too much, and what would you rather, think? you know, whatever, what do you collect think donations for immediate of? relief aid or, or 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 something else, you know, and 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 just not get into a lot of the a lot of the political discussion. Everybody can make their own choices. I mean, I think I think it's legitimate to to not want to engage with something necessarily. Like you know, just because you're an American Jew doesn't mean you have to have something to say about Israel and Palestine, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's part, part of it is is that's also part of it right you know part of having the like part of opposing zionism is having a diasporic identity that owes nothing to israel not positive not negative right it's just, it just like you know like not in my name okay not in my name but you know i think i think the main thing is is just to keep it human to keep it empathetic to keep it compassionate to avoid 
getting into the two sidedness. If you want two sides, it's the sides of the side of the armed hierarchical uh, groups of men and the side of of the the civilian population. And and it, and it's true that civilian populations are hijacked into supporting those groups of men on their side. That's kind of how the state works. It's how nationalism works. It's how you know that that's the world we live in. That's exactly what we're dealing with here. Right. So just by flipping it from the vertical optic, sorry, from the horizontal optic, the vertical optic of conflict, we're already doing something very significant as anarchists. Talking about the side of the people against the side of the governments or would-be governments, right? The side, yeah, the side of 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 the of the of the regular everyday working people and the armed organizations. Um, states, would-be states, whatever, um, being able to, to talk like that and to show real internationalist perspective rather than taking a side within the kind of terms of the debate that are dictated to us by states, I think that's that's already something. Yeah, I absolutely agree. But, you know, as an anarchist, I'm also like a very big believer in like what we do through our personal human connections with people. It's less about what we say, and more about who we interact with and how we bring a, 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 a love of humanity and a love of freedom and a love of, of you know, and, and an international solidarity and a love of the earth into all of these things as, as a perspective that we carry with us into any particular struggle or issue, right? I mean, I think, you know, a struggle isn't often an anarchist struggle as such. It's about bringing an anarchist perspective into precisely single issue or, you know, localized struggles. And it could be a, a, a strike at a factory and it could be an environmental action, it could be an, whatever it is. Um, and the Israeli-Palestine thing, because it's it tends to be so coded nationalistically is is a very difficult place to do that because you're expected to take sides and you know if you're and I, of course that, that still has that still needs to meet you know you still need to show and, and be able to talk about how asymmetric the power relations are in the situation. And now it's not a kind of, you shouldn't do a both sidism because there is an asymmetry of power there. But it's not about those sides at all. It's about those sides in general, right? And how, how that, that pans out. So, you know, there are no, I can't really give answers. I think it's a stake that we have to play day after day in the words of uh, Alfredo Bonanno, who just passed. Um, oh, yeah. And and uh, and, uh, but I think it's the human connections, and especially the human connections with Palestinians, that are that are the key to this, you know. And 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 I don't have a lot of that going on right now in my in my location and, and what's going on with me. But you know, like I'm uh, right now, one of the main things, the main practical thing I'm doing, is translating reports about right-wing settler attacks that are ongoing in the West Bank, in, in the South Hebron Hills and the East uh, uh, Slopes. And there's really daily, you know, uh, collaboration between the military and settlers in attacking the m poorest shepherding communities or living in shanties and tents. And, and you know, that's, that's kind of the uh, cutting edge of, of settler expansionism there. Uh, in the outposts, in the in the more kind of uh, arid parts of the West Bank, essentially, and um, these are like militias right, that are doing it, right? They're there is well, it's uh, uh, there is a situation there where the uh, boundaries between the military and the settlers is very blurry. So the military has created a unit that functions there that is made up of right-wing outpost kids 
Settlers who are not on active duty still often have military-issued guns, uniforms that they might wear, might not wear. It's it's a very sort of it's like you know where where does the where does the 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 Russian army end and the uh, uh, Russian nationalist militias begin. Right? Yeah. Where does the Ukrainian army end and the and the uh, Ukrainian nationalist militias begin? So it's not, you know. So there's there's both of those things. But what the, the point I'm saying is that you know the people who are actually producing those reports and doing the solidarity on the ground day to day, yeah, these are Israeli Jews, and they have very personal, immediate connections with those Palestinian villagers. Okay. And that's where the real solidarity is. It's the it's the on the ground human connection, day to day stuff that's going on. And there's a lot of that. Okay, and, and and people need to 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 understand that. Like right now, there's you know it's a war and it's bad, but like the opening that has been created in Israel Palestine for binationalism, for a politics of partnership. Okay, was never bigger than before this war started. Okay, the war has obviously kind of obscured all that, but through the protests against Netanyahu, through the kind of you know stuff with all its limitations, like there, like you know the the like the head of the of the kind of of the Islamic Party in Israel's parliament, you know, is one of the most sensible and 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 kind of appreciated figures right now you know was in Israeli politics at you know so so it's it's there is a lot of hope on the human level it is happening um again it's small it's a minority but it but it exists it's still there it will always be there um and and we need to find how to draw sustenance from that okay as Jewish anarchists we the first thing we need, is radical Palestinian partners, yeah. Wherever we are, or ra- or or you know, like so- someone we can talk to on on that level, someone, and and you know, and to connect with people who are very knowledgeable about it, because like once you're talking to a Palestinian, you know that they know, because <laughs> a Palestinian doesn't they does knows about the complexities also of Israeli society, and they 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 you know the like people who are who are aware and connected and not just Johnny come lately to the cause du jour, they're the ones that you want to, you want to put your solidarity with in, in those situations. So, you know, that, that might help. And uh, I think, you know, I think, I think uh, it's also legitimate for, for Jewish radicals and anarchists to form their own associations for mutual aid and support to have, you know, and there have been, uh, you know, radical Jewish blocks, not just anarchists, maybe more broadly kind of, you know, Jewish lefty blocks within this Palestinian solidarity movement right now. And I think that's a, that's a place to go in and find connections and alliances as well. Um, or, you know, just focus on local environmental stuff or, or some other topic and, and stay away from it if that's, if that's better for you. Right, and that's and that's also a totally legitimate choice, right? I don't think I don't think you have to engage with it, but if you do, then do it with the people who have a politics that you can deal, you know, that that, that you can talk to. So, what? There's one more thing I'm curious about. If you are uh, knowledgeable about this group, FADA, F A U D A. That it, I've seen a couple communities. Yeah, 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 yeah. I better not say too much. I mean, I, I, I didn't get the impression that they are very um, imbued with an anarchistic spirit. But who am I to judge? Right. Right. I mean, a lot of the stuff that they've been saying is is still very much within the framework of the Palestine National Movement. They also said stuff that's critical of top-down forces in general. Um, I don't know how many of them there are. 
I, I guess there's about at least five distinct people there. So it's a, it's a group, you know, I mean, they, they, they're worth engaging with. Of course they are. Um, whether they're, you know, I, I, I don't know a lot to say. I mean, I, I don't think that they're, that what they're saying or doing is some, is something that's worth kind of taking as, okay, this is the Palestinian anarchists position and, and so on and so on. Like, no, it's it's a group of comrades. They're finding their way through that. Their political expression is is where it is. Um, okay, that's that's what's happening. I mean, you know, anarchists against the wall at its time was also didn't have a comprehensive anarchist platform. Was you know, I mean, yeah, people were anti capitalist, people were feminist, and that, but it was kind of a single issue thing. You know, it was essentially a, a kind of. A, a uh, ride-sharing agency to, to Palestinian led demos in the West Bank, and it didn't have all the politics, and it had leadership issues, and it had all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and and kind of Ashkenazi privilege issues, and w- anything you want. So there are always lots of imperfections, right? There are always lots of issues. Uh, you know, I think I think we mustn't romanticize anyone or anything. Um, and if there is uh, pragmatic stuff that can be done in 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 that way, then that's that's okay too. But you know, that's that's my impression there. Yeah, that's that's kind of the impression I get too. Uh, and I see other people making similar statements. Um, you know, just in comments on anarchist news or where whatever. So yeah, I think. Uh, I think what we've talked about so far is all really important and, you know, I don't want to drag this out too much and just it's like, been an hour, so yeah. yeah, dump, dump it all over everyone. But, uh, thank you for coming on and absolutely sharing what you have to say about this. Glad to, I, uh, yeah, I hope we see better days or at least I hope this, this ends and, and that we have, like I said, ceasefire now hostages home. Beat me to jail. All right. I'll leave it at that. All right, then. Take care. You too.